Dr. Narsimolo has made my job much more easier because I think he has given a nice, beautiful introduction to probabilities of connective tissue disease. That, has, that makes one message clear that for making a diagnosis with reference to connective tissue disease, investigation just supports but doesn't conclude the diagnosis. It's the clinical examination which really makes a big difference for us to make a conclusive diagnosis, whether it is a connective tissue disease or not. MRI and your cardiogram has really changed the scenario of the neurology as well as the cardiology, which we were eager to think it as a challenging to make a clinical diagnosis. The moment you take MR, or the moment you take a CT of the respective structure in CNS, you know where the diagnosis and where the lesion is. For which, as an undergraduate and postgraduate, most of you remember that we have literally fought to say this could be the level, that could be the level. At the end of the day, now we know very clearly MR speaks something else. With reference to connective tissue disease, the problem we have is we know very well in the beginning that it speaks something else rather than what the investigation tells me. So basically, in a sense, ANA could be positive, it may not be SLE. The other way around, it could be SLE, ANA could be negative. Because in 3% of the lupus, SLE could be, ANA could be negative. In a quite a good number of other conditions, ANA could be positive. The slides you could collect from Professor Narsi Malu, he did show you quite a good number of places where ANA could be positive. So in a nutshell, it becomes very critical for us to understand and appreciate what are we talking about with reference to a making a diagnosis in connective tissue disease, all the more in SLE. I always try to call it SLE as a clinical encyclopedia for a very simple reason. If you know SLE and its manifestation, you are almost able to cover 50 to 60 percent of the various clinical manifestations you can discuss and think about. And if you know, know about HIV, you can cover other 40%. So more or less, SLE is more or less a sort of a partial clinical encyclopedia where you can expect any manifestation or any of the features. So the problems are not so simple. In a sense, the manifestation could be varied. The second problem is the manifestation may not happen all at a time. In a sense, you may not have a malar rash as well as an arthritis in the same situation. Patient may give over a period of time, the end of before she walking, she may say, I get burning sensation two, three years before whenever I exposed to sun. It may not come down now, it may reappear again later. Similarly, the joints pay. Patient may slowly tell that I probably doctor had told me I had a joint strain or something like that a couple of years before, which if you look into the documentation of the previous consultant, he might have mentioned a note arthritis plus. Or sometimes a pleural effusion which was diagnosed as tuberculosis, if you look back, the ESR was not that high, AFB was all the time negative, nothing more to suggest that it was a tuberculosis. Patient very well say, I took ATT for two, three months, I was doing very well, but suddenly I had a problem. And somehow my problem settled over a period of time. The most difficult problem we face sometimes with this group of connective tissue disease, it can settle on its own and may come back after some time. I, we do have seen in our experience the patients who have come spread over a period of 10 years, documented pretty well, they have at some point of time, pleural effusion at some point of time, arthritis at some point of time. It's enough to make reasonable diagnosis of SLE. So what I try to emphasize here is you need to take a careful clinical history, try to pick up as much as information as possible from the patients as well as from the patient's record before you move on to diagnose and evaluate the patients. Another important thing why I picked up this particular topic, I introduced this particular issue is evaluating this patient is pretty critical. The next speaker is going to tell you about that why this evaluation is a must because the treatment is not uniform. It's not a simplified protocol like as you see in tuberculosis or any other infective disease. In tuberculosis, it's very clear, patient suspected, confirmed tuberculosis, starting with a three or four drugs, or few other regimens which are very clear and very obvious. 
But here, it's not so simple. The moment you make an SLE, your drug of choice could be as simple, plain, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug to your worst, severe, aggressive, immunosuppressive drugs. So in a sense, you need to be crystal clear what are you trying to tackle in a given patient. The protocols are patient-specific and unique to each of these patients because what appears may not be what it is. Why I take this particular statement is we may feel patients don't have any major complications or problems. He might have ignored to get a newly routine test done in his two, three visits. He may land up to see in his four visit creatinine is shooting high. In a sense, then you would have realized some old investigation with the patient was carried from some other consultant, urine was showing good number of RBCs, good number of glucosides. In a sense, patient was silent from the renal angle, but you missed possible renal involvement which could have been picked up and managed at that point of time. So what I make point very clear is, with reference to most of the connective tissue disease, all the more with reference to SLE, a careful evaluation, careful diagnostic consideration is a must before we get into the diet, before we get into the treatment strategies. ACR criteria, when there are nine plus three, clinical criteria, and a few points we need to remember that is it's not always necessary in a clinical practice the patient should fulfill all the criteria. These criteria are made with an intention to have a uniform reporting with reference to clinical research. In a sense, sometimes we may have not have all the features or enough criteria to say that the patient has SLE or no SLE. The treatment strategies might be in line of SLE. We use various terms like incomplete lupus, non-classical lupus, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, over a period of time, you do find them to have a typical complete lupus. In a sense, it's not right on our part to say that the patient is not fulfilling ACR criteria of SLE. I do not want to start any treatment with reference to SLE. So let's be very clear that the ACR criteria are more so for the, refer I mean, for the publications, for a reference, so that there is some amount of uniformity in the reporting. But in clinical, good clinical practice, we need to be should, should I have to say that where to ignore these criteria? You, you should be a little more expert to decide yourself that yes, it could be still lupus, I would like to go in that line. The other critical point which we need to know is there are a good number of medicators. The most commonest in tender patient is an Epstein Barr virus infection and few of the viral infection. The worst mimicker of this is a tuberculosis and another thing not to forget is the lepromaris leprosy and the lepra reactions wherein you can sure enough to miss the possible making a diagnosis of SLE or a connective tissue disease. So there are quite a good number of mimickers which are not SLE where you need to make yourself sure that it is something else not SLE. So you need to be clear that it is either not an SLE or it is SLE. So this point should be clear. And ACR criteria, beyond any doubt, helps, guides us in making a diagnosis, but it's not a mandatory to make a diagnosis. To diagnose, we either do anti-nuclear antibodies, anti-DS DNA, Smith, specific, less sensitive because it's seen in very small percentage of patients, anti-nuclear zone as well as one of the new set uh, antibody positive suggests more specifically lupus, although more so with the involvement of the uh, renal involvement. Fast VDRs are anti phospholipid antibody or lupus anticoagulant positive. It's one another clinical criteria that is considered lab investigation to make a diagnosis of lupus. These tests will support you to make a diagnosis, and one may need to check on one or two of these. Most often we use KNA as a first stage, subsequently is required to go on for other tests. In dermatology, the manifestation that could be scarring, subcutaneous lupus rashes, cutaneous infarcts, oral ulcers, renards, digital infarcts, and so on. What is required in dermatological examination is examine, explore completely all the possible skin rashes, map the possible skin rashes so that when you are following up, you are able to identify whether it is progressing, regressing, and what is likely to go for scarring. And 
If you are an adult, a skin biopsy, good histopathological examination, as well as an immunofluorescence test, especially for lupus band, will help you to make a reasonable diagnosis. This is necessary only when you are in doubt of a diagnosis. When it's quite obvious skin lesion, quite obvious rash, there is no necessary to go for either a skin biopsy or a histopathological examination. What I'm trying to say is, when you are doubt about a possible other differential diagnosis, it may be necessary to go for a skin biopsy. <coughs> Pleural pulmonary and cardiac manifestation, you need to have a check on that. So as a routine in the very beginning, it's best to have a X-ray chest because patient could be asymptomatic and have a pleuropericardial infusion. Of course, a good clinical examination can definitely pick up this possibility of the involvement. Endocarditis, the clinically suspecting, and pneumonitis and shrinking lung syndromes are various other manifestations which can come with reference to pleuropulmonary cardiac uh, involvement. At that point of time, uh, if required, one can go for ultrasound of them and ECO and ECG, PFA and HRC. What I am putting in the right are optionals in a sense. You can look for it or go for it only when you are definitely feeling the possibility of a serous uh, effusion in the form of pericardial effusion or in the form of peric uh, pericarditis or any other possibilities pulmonary involvement or any such problems, one need to check it out for all this. <coughs> Neurological features. This is one another important uh, uh, organ which is affected. The neurological involvement usually or invariably suggests a possible, not a good prognosis. But good clinical examination is the cornerstone in identifying neurological uh, features. Most commonest is headache, but of course, when you are having a neurological deficit, when you have a possibility of a neurological involvement, one can look out for further test. Involvement could be direct, that is where the patient's involvement could be because of lupus and lupus disease activity like psychosis, cerebritis, and meningitis, which are a direct involvement of lupus per se, or secondary to vasculitis, which are another component of lupus, or could be a possible association of APL syndrome, wherein there could be thrombosis, either in artery or vein, which can result in neurological tips. So to evaluate further, one can check out for CT or MRI to localize the lesion, CSF analysis, nerve conduction studies, when you are suspecting a possible peripheral neuropathy, EEG, especially if the patient presents with seizure or seizure-like activity to document or evaluate the possible possibility of a neurological involvement. Renal involvement is one of the commonest cause for both mortality as well as morbidity. One has to keep this particular thing in mind that any time a lupus diagnosed may land up with renal involvement. That's one of the reasons in most of the follow-ups of lupus, we insist and suggest to have creatinine and a simple good clinical routine examination of urine for the cells, cars, etc. So you need to look out for a regular urine routine examination, serum creatinine level, so that one can look for a possible renal involvement in any course of the disease. The when, of course, in the very first presentation, we always suggest one to have a urine routine and a serum PID to exclude a possible renal involvement. So the, when you are seriously and strongly considering a possible renal involvement, one can go for further to have a 24-hour urinary protein and creatinine clearance. And when you are suspecting a lesion to be either of a group uh, class 3 or class 4 or when you are worried about between class 2 and class 3, one can go for a renal biopsy and we also suggest if the disease is of a long term duration, one needs to go for ultrasound to see the size of the disease, especially when the creatinine is very high and lupus is of a longer term disease. If you look for the size of the kidney, the kidney size are shrunken, it is most likely the patient whom you are dealing is an end stage renal disease. There is no point anymore in going for a renal biopsy. But where you are suspicious of an active disease or an early disease, 
where you are confused between a group 3 and group 4 or group 2 and group 3, where the decision making with reference to therapeutics are different, one can go for a renal biopsy which is subjected for both histopathological examination as well as indirect interfluorescence uh, uh, tests which will give us a reasonable classification of the renal involvement which will be dealt in the next uh, lecture how to go about in handling this group of diseases. These are the various biopsy modes which you can see. And another important finding that you see is the reference to hematological. One need to look for a positive anemia, chromocytopenia, leukopenia, or any of these combinations. Most interesting aspect of leukopenia, what you see is most of the lupus associated leukopenias are lymphopenias. Usually the lymphocyte complex is less. You do can see the uh, other group, the neutrophils, being reduced, but most of the time it is the lymphopenia which is seen as a component of lymphopenia. So that's why it's invariable good to have a good uh, blood count, a good peripheral smear examination. When you are suspecting a hemolytic anemia, you need to check for Coombs test, bilirubinemias, elevated NH, other markers of hemolysis. When you are a serious suspicion or a confusion whether it is between a peripheral destruction versus the ecclesia because the ecclesia is also being described in a rare entity as an association with lupus. If you are seriously considering the possibility of a hypoplasia or ecclesia, one can go for bone marrow biopsy and examination. Any additional features, whether it is a fever, infection versus the disease activity, the C3 and CRP will help you. C3, CRP and ESR are in good monitoring for the disease activity as well as anti-DSDNA can be taken as a title for monitoring the disease activity. When blood culture, when you are doubt between the infection versus this, and ultrasound and other modalities to exclude a possible infection whenever you face a case of uh, any other additional features, you are less likely or difficult to explain with the lupus as a primary disease. In a nutshell, I, I can precisely put it, to evaluate and to make a diagnosis of SLE, we can't have a set protocol. I can, make, I can say that you do A, B, C test, probably you will end up with A, B, C, D information. Based on that, you can come to a conclusion that, that this is possibly lupus. But certainly, you have to tailor make it based case by case, so that you can, as Professor uh, Narsimha will put it, it is back to under investigate, it is worse to over investigate. So we think the, the tail line between the bad and worse is too small. So the problem is how more to investigate, how less to investigate is always a big question. Because as I was trying to tell you, in an asymptomatic patient, whom you are not seriously suspecting a renal involvement, is urine routine examination an additional? It's a big question. But I personally feel in a lupus it is not, considering the cost of it, the amount of information it's going to give you. But on the contrary, repeating anti DSDNA, knowing very well three months before it was negative, may not be a required investigation. So you need to be very clear, justifiably right, in what is the likely test you would like to have. See, in general, for a follow-up, it's good to have a hemogram, ESR, and a urine protein, a stable lupus. But in an active lupus, it's always best to check out what is the manifestation you have. Based on that, one has to design a protocol how you are going to follow up this patient. Because we always feel sometimes, retrospectively, that we, I should have just done a simple X-ray for this patient on the chest, because I definitely missed this particular finding. Postmodern, Thinking about a chest X-ray is not justifiable. And of course, patient has every right to shoot back and to say that, doctor, why did you ask my chest X-ray? So, so in, in a sense, we need to be very clear with reference to this. What are we trying to look at? And what are we really trying to work? There are a few just to mention that we have various uh, follow-up scoring system like flea die, bass die, and various other clinical measures that are more often we use in the following up of the patients in the specialty clinic, how to follow the SLEs, damage index, activity index, and so on and so forth. So in a nutshell, the, with reference to the lupus, I just put this as a nutshell, the possibilities are many. Handling the lupus is definitely a rough road. 
it, it's really a really tough time sometimes when we land up with some critical issues to make a diagnosis, whether it's an infection, active lupus, whether to go with the aggressive, immunosuppressive, or not to go with the aggressive, to suppressive. But we need to be a little more careful. Certainly, it helps us to go in a better way. A good planning, good thinking about how to evaluate, how to diagnose a lupus, will take us a long way with reference to the patient care. Thank you very much.